Good morning. Good morning. morning. All right, let's get right into it. Uh, Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, as they just said in the video today, we're going to be concluding uh, the series that we've been in called I Am. One time, let me hear you say I Am. I Am. am. It's actually over the last eight weeks we've been studying all of the different I Am statements of Jesus uh, that he gives in the Gospel of John. We've studied him saying, Uh, Before Abraham was, I am. And that's kind of where it all starts, right? This I am was this title given to God in the burning bush with Moses. And Jesus says, yeah, I'm him. I'm the God in the burning bush, which was a stunning statement. And and then he he takes that I am, that, that title given to God, and he applies it in several different ways. He goes on to say, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate, I am the vine, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life. And today, as we conclude, we're going to be looking at the last I am statement that Jesus makes. And here it is. He's going to say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he just throws in this interesting ending. And then he says, and let's make no mistake, no one comes to the Father but by me. Like, this is what we're going to study today in our teaching. So, uh, I guess I'll start here. Last year, uh, the General Conference of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada was in Winnipeg. So, my wife and I uh, went to the conference. We flew into Winnipeg, had a great time there. And then we were on our way back, flying out of Winnipeg into Windsor, but we had a layover in Toronto. Anybody ever been to Pearson International Airport before? It's like a collective groan just goes over the church. And so we had this layover to get our connecting flight into Windsor. And so we left Winnipeg right on time. We landed in Toronto right on time. Our our plane rolled up to the gate right on time. And then a very interesting thing happened. Uh, they, They didn't let us off the plane. Uh, And you know, you know that moment you ever flown before in and it's like all of a sudden that ding, you can undo your seatbelt and you land it and like everybody stands up like they have some place to go and you don't move for like five minutes. The problem was we all did that except they didn't let us go for an hour. We were stuck on the tarmac for an hour because apparently the gate that we pulled up to, it's called a swing gate or something. And I don't know, an American flight came through and I don't know, I don't have to understand. All I know is we're sitting there and the longer we sat on the plane, the more the anxiety, you ever feel that? Like you can feel your blood pressure just going up. I'm in one of those moments because my phone starts dinging and it's Air Canada texting me, telling me, "Uh, please go to your gate. Your your connecting flight's about to board. (laughs) So we wait another 10 minutes and then I get another text. Please go to your gate. Your flight is now boarding. So then we wait about another 20 minutes. I get another text. Please board now. This is the final call for Air Canada flight, blah, 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 to Windsor. Like it, and like literally we're talking to the pilot, like somebody open the door. Like we got to get out of here. And, and so finally they open up the door. And you ever seen that movie Home Alone? <laughs> you know that scene when they're sprinting through the airport? I've never had that before until this day. My wife and I, we get out and we are in a full-on sprint through the Pearson International Airport full of people bumping in. I don't know what was happening, but we knew where we had to go and we're running and running and running and finally we get to the counter. There's a lady behind the counter and we tell them, like, we can't breathe, right? So we're like, (laughs) you know, and so we're just trying to communicate to her, like, we're on this flight, you know, we have tickets, we're supposed supposed to go. She's the nice lady, she says, oh, I'm so sorry. (laughs) You're too late. And I can look out the window, the plane's still there. It's not moving. So I'm telling her, no, it's right there. Let us on. I, I got my ticket right here. We're here. She says, I'm so, this must be so frustrating for you. <laughs> she says, you see, the problem is there's this door. And once it's shut, we're not allowed to open it. And then she says, but here's the good news. <laughs> she says, there's another flight 
to Windsor, leaving tonight in six hours from now. <laughs> and so what are you going to do, right? Like, it's not like you can leave. So, so, so we end up sitting in the Pearson International Airport for six hours. <laughs> And when we left Winnipeg, it was a great time away, but like we wanted to be home. We missed our kids. And then uh, the thing was, once that delay came, that last six hours that we had to wait, you ever been in a situation where it's like every minute that passes feels like an hour? This was one of those. All we wanted to do was be home, but I thought we're in the airport. There's so much stuff to do. Look at all the shops, the restaurants. So we went, we ate a good meal. We, I think I went in every single shop and looked at every single item, then looked down at my watch and 15 minutes had somehow passed. <laughs> like time was moving so slow. <laughs> and, and really what was happening over that time um, was we became homesick. Like there was this strong feeling like all we wanted to do was be home with our kids. And I I kind of tell this story because in the same way that Natalie and I were homesick for our children, the reality is that every single one of us in this room on some level is homesick for God. Every single one of us, the, the the book of Ecclesiastes says that God has actually placed in our hearts eternity. He's actually hardwired us on some point that, that, that we have this awareness that this life is not it, right? That we actually belong, we desire to be with God in our heavenly home, but we're not there yet. In, in, in one sense, this life right now is kind of like a long stay in Pearson International Airport, right? It's kind of fun and there's some stuff to do. There's a mission and there's a purpose to this life, but please make no mistake, we are not home. This life, the way that it is right here, right now, we are not home yet. Now, now, the reason why I start this with this story and kind of this analogy is because this is exactly the context where we find this next I am statement of Jesus. John 14, Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples, and he's comforting them. He ends up having to give this whole big comfort message because right before what we're about to read, he has told them, listen, I know God's plan. I know I'm going to die. I know I'm going to resurrect, and I'm going to ascend back into heaven. And when he starts talking about this gap in him going away and them being left, this creates a panic in them like it would any of us, right? These, these men have just given up everything to be with Jesus. They, they, they left their jobs, they let, left their security, and usually when you do this and you attach yourself to a rabbi, this is for life. But here they've spent three years with the man and now he's saying, hey, it's been a great three years, but I'm leaving. And they are anxiety-ridden inside. And so what Jesus does is he brings them comfort. And this is what we want to read right here. John 14, pick it up in verse 1. So Jesus says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Isn't that good? I mean, this is absolutely beautiful here. Jesus uses a metaphor uh, of a big house to describe our our eternal uh, home, heaven. And it's beautiful. In this picture, he says, everybody who calls upon the name of Jesus, you get a room in the house. It's beautiful. But it is a metaphor. It is. Like, please make no mistake, Jesus right now is not up in heaven with a hammer and nails b- building a big hotel. Okay? That, that's, that's not it. You see, what, what's, what's happening here, Jesus is actually using their very understood uh, marriage customs of the day to describe our heavenly home. You see, 2,000 years ago in the Middle Eastern world, in the Jewish community, if you were to get married, what would happen uh, exclusively is that the father would pick out the bride for the son. And then 
uh, oaths were made between the families, certain levels of contracts between the, the families. And, and quite literally, that, that couple would be betrothed. They would be married, but they wouldn't come together yet. One thing would have to happen first. The groom would leave, and he would go and build a home, prepare the home. And only after preparing the home would the groom come back and take his wife, and the two would become one. Jesus here sees the disciples' anxiety, and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Just like a groom goes away to prepare the home, I'm going away for a little bit, but in the end, I will come back. And when I do, we will be united together forever. This is the picture. I mean, that's, that's comforting, right? This is absolutely comforting. This is the message that he gives. It's beautiful. And then he goes on to say this in verse four. He says, you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? <laughs> Poor Thomas, eh? <laughs> I mean, he only shows up a few times in scripture and he is like the global expression of what doubt and conflict looks like with Jesus. Like every time he's just engaged in a really weird kind of moment with, with, with Jesus. Jesus here, right, has this, has this moment where he says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. And Thomas says, no, we don't. We don't know where, how, how, how are we supposed to know the way? We don't even know where you're going. We don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. Oh, doubting Thomas. <laughs> Full of conflict. Isn't it interesting? Like, how, how bummed out would you be if your mistakes became the title of your life? You ever think about that? Like, oh, there's Brenda the addict. There's Bob the cheater, right? Like, that's awkward. But, but what happens? What do we know Thomas is? Doubting Thomas. <laughs> it's like the poor guy, right? Jesus says, you know the way to the place where I'm going. He says, no, we don't. I don't know what you're talking about, Jesus. Like, honestly, Parker, I was thinking about this. Isn't it, like, pretty amazing that the gospel writers even include Thomas in the story? <laughs> you ever think about that? Wouldn't it have just been easier to, like, ignore this awkward moment? But they don't. I, I, I was honestly thinking about this. I, I think... The Bible includes Thomas because God doesn't skip over humanity. Amen. And what this says to you and I is, is this, that God, uh, he has room for doubters. And God has room for those who haven't figured it all out yet. God works with people who, who, who still are, are, are trying to make sense of his words. God makes room for humanity. So much so that when Thomas said this, he doesn't bypass his comment. He speaks directly to him. And it's out of this that Jesus gives the final I am statement. Jesus says to Thomas in verse six, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Thomas says, Jesus, we don't know the way. Jesus says, yes, you do. It's me. And then he makes three kind of powerful I am statements all wrapped up in one where he says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And so for the next little bit, what I want to do is I just want to explore all three of these and see what they teach us about Jesus. You good to go with me on this journey? Okay, if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the first thing we learn about Jesus, and it's this. Jesus is the only way. Jesus is the only way. One of the very interesting things about the, the early church, and I'm talking the very early church, the very first Christians weren't called Christians at all. They were called followers of the way. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> I love that. Followers of the way. It, the idea was that there was a Jesus way to live your life in the here and now that was different from everything the world had to offer. And although that's a beautiful aspect of what was wrapped into that title, the way, that it doesn't fully speak to it. Yes, 
It meant how they lived their lives in the here and now, but it also spoke of eternity and how we get there. This entire passage here is wrapped up in eternity. Jesus says, I am the way. I, I, I need two volunteers this morning, okay? If you want to volunteer, raise your hand. Come on up. Come on up. I got one, two. Br Brick, come on up. Okay. Okay. Brandon, stand there. Okay, stand right here. R no, like right on the corner here. Like, like right here. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, yeah. Awesome. Welcome our volunteers. Welcome our volunteers. Okay. I'm going to try to illustrate this uh, as, as, as best as I can. You are going to represent mankind, okay? Everything in mankind is right here. You are God. <laughs> I know, I know. Just God help us. It, it's a jump, okay? But just go there for the sake of the illustration. Brandon, you're God, okay? Now, here's the problem. There's a gap. There's a gap between humanity and God. Remember what Ecclesiastes says. God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. God has placed inside of mankind this desire to be with him. Like we know this. We feel this on some level, right? We desire. The problem is this gap between where we are and where we want to be. Because this gap is, it's not an ocean. It's not a canyon. It's, it's a chasm. It's, it's, it's a void that is actually brought on because of sin. Sin, fundamentally, what it does is it separates us from God. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do to bridge this gap. Many have tried and many have failed. There is nothing that we can do. Nothing. We cannot get to God. This is the bad news. Now here's the good news. So what does God do? God came to us. He sent his son Jesus to earth. Now I get to play the role of Jesus. You know, I'm just saying, it just happened to work out this way. He sent Jesus to earth, which I, I love, first of all, that Jesus is the son of God does not mean that one day God had a baby. Like there was this moment when Jesus was not there and all of a sudden, 2,000 years ago, he was. That is not what the scriptures teach. Jesus being the son of God, God birthed into the world his very essence and being, his very nature in human form. His name was Jesus. And he came to live the perfect life, the spotless life, the sinless life, and to die the sinner's death. You see, Colossians teaches us, and we've actually revisited this over the last couple services we've had, but in Colossians it says that when Jesus died on the cross, it says that our sins were nailed to the cross with him. So now for anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus, here, come on. Walk over this way. You're just going to illustrate the point. For anybody who calls upon the name of Jesus, now you get God. You get eternal life. How? Because Jesus became the bridge. Yeah. Jesus became the conduit. And I need to tell you this. This is very important. Jesus being the way and the only way, this has not changed in over 2,000 years. It just hasn't changed. Like there was one way for my grandparents' generation. There was one way for my parents' generation. There's one way for my generation. There's one way for my kids' generation. And should God tarry and wait longer, long after we're all gone and dead, there will still be one way. His name is Jesus Christ. And so when we couldn't make a way, God made a way. God came to us through the person of Jesus Christ. And now for anybody who calls upon the name of the Lord, get saved. You get, you, you get a free ticket home. You get at one day, you get to leave Pearson International Airport. Okay? And you get to go home. Can we just thank our volunteers here? Good job. Good job. Jesus is the way. He... He bridges the gap, and he's the only one who can bridge the gap. But that's not the only thing that Jesus said. 
He didn't say, I'm just the only way. The second thing that we learn about Jesus is this, that he is absolute truth. Absolute truth. One of the things that's becoming very popular in our culture today is what's called relativism. Relativism teaches that there is no one truth that fits on all people everywhere. This has become so pervasive in our culture that we even use sayings like, speak your truth. And if that's true for you, that's fine, that's good. It might not be true for me. In that statement alone, we make the claim, truth is relative, right? So th- th- like this is so pervasive in our culture. There's no such thing as absolute truth. And then you apply this to Jesus. Well, Jesus cannot be true for all people at all times and all places. This is a problem. And oftentimes when people speak like this, they'll, they'll use a parable of the king and the blind men to prove their point. If you haven't heard it before, I'll just share it with you really quick. It goes like this. One day there was a king and he had an elephant and uh, he wanted to have an experiment. And so he brought in a bunch of blind men and he told them to feel around in front of them and then explain to them, to him, what they were touching. So the first touches the side of the elephant and says, it's a wall. The other grabs the tail and says, it's a snake. The other grabs the tusk and says, it's a sword, right? You get, you get the picture. They, they all experienced and touched a different part of the elephant, thus they explained it different. And this parable is often told to try to explain all the different world religions today. And they'll just say, well, all the religions are kind of like the blind men, right? Like we're all experiencing just part of the truth. None of us see that it's actually an elephant. None of us see all the truth at once. And uh, shocker, I take issue with this. Because the only way, get this, the only way that you can say that none of the religions have the whole picture, the only way that you can say that is if in the parable of the king and the blind men that you're in the position of the king. You alone see ultimate reality. You alone see ultimate truth, and apparently everybody else is just fumbling around in the dark. Can I tell you right now, this is the absolute height of arrogance, masked in humility and tolerance, and it is offensive. It is offensive. And so I I, I think instead of trying to just demote everyone's belief systems, why don't we actually just start with saying, all around the world, There are people who legitimately believe that their way is true. So the question is, why Jesus? Instead of just pretending like we're all kind of the same, why don't we say, no, we're not. (laughs) So why Jesus and not Muhammad? Why Jesus and not Buddha? Why Jesus and not Confucius? Why is Jesus more trustworthy than all the rest? Isn't that a good question? (laughs) Why? And honestly, I think there's a lot of answers that we could give to this, but I'll just give you one, just one today. Because every single thing that Jesus has ever said will come to pass or has come to pass. Like every word that comes out of his mouth is true. And we can, and he has proven this over and over again. So at one point, Jesus said, my words will never pass away. And that is literally, like what are we doing right now? studying his words. How about when Jesus told Peter, you're going to deny me three times before morning, and then within hours, it happens. Or how about when Jesus prophesied, not just that he would die, but that he would die the death of crucifixion during Passover in Jerusalem. And then what happened? He died the death of crucifixion during Passover in Jerusalem. Several times Jesus said, and on the third day, I'm going to rise again. And then what happened? On the third day, he rose again and came back to life with hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of eyewitnesses to that event. Like everything that Jesus says comes true. I I love when Jesus was standing with Pilate. They're in this really interesting uh, Pontius Pilate right before he died. Jesus says this, For this reason, I came into the world to testify to the truth. He says, everyone on the side of truth listens to my voice. Oh, that's a good good Jesus statement right there, right? Everyone on the side of, Jesus didn't say, you know what? 
we just kind of, I just see this part, but really the other religions, they got that. But no, it's not what he does. He says, I am truth. There's not many roads to God. There's not many ways back to God. There is one way back to God. It's me. Trust me. And he has proven this over and over and over again. Everything he said is true. Park would hear it. Jesus is the only way. And Jesus is absolute truth. Absolute truth. And which brings us into the third point is this, that Jesus is the source of life. Remember the context. Jesus is speaking these words to his disciples at the Last Supper, saying, I'm going to leave. They're filled with fear, anxiety. They don't know what to do. This is confusing to them, right? So, so Jesus brings comfort in the midst of their pain, in the midst of their confusion, But his comfort is ultimately saying that he is not just the way, he's not just the truth, but he is the life. What he's saying, and you got to get this, he's saying, disciples, listen to me, he's saying, you're so concerned with the here and now. Right now, he said, I can see it on your faces, You're, you're so concerned because what I'm telling you that I'm leaving doesn't seem to line up with your version of how this was gonna go. And so he says, you're concerned with this life in the here and now, but he's saying what you need to be concerned with is eternity. All of this, remember, is wrapped up in eternity. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He says, you gotta get your eyes on me. I am the life. You you know what's interesting? And maybe we can all just agree. This life here and now, man, it's just fragile. Like it's just, it just is. I I was um, bathing my son a couple nights ago and got out of the bath and I wrapped him up in a towel and I hugged him really tight and he looked up at me and he said, Daddy, he said, are you dying? Like, whoa. <laughs> it's like, where'd that come from, buddy? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. I'm like, what, what's up? And he looked at me and he said, your, your beard is so white. Your beard is so... <laughs> I was like... <laughs> if ever you need to be humble, just stick around my kids. <laughs> Isn't it interesting, though, that my three-year-old son is able on some level to see that this life is fragile. He's three. He's three. And he can pick it up. I was actually Googling this week. I was trying to figure this out. Um, How many people die on earth every second? You want to know how many? Three. Three people on earth die every second. You want to, you want to, you want to, listen to this. Okay? Every clap is a death. This is what's happening right now, all around the world. Every clap is somebody going. Every clap is another family mourning. This life is fragile. From the time that you walked in this place to the time that you will leave, somewhere in the ballpark of 16,000 people on earth would have died. It's fragile. Jesus knows this. The Bible doesn't hide this. The Bible speaks to this over and over. It says, what is your life? You're like a mist that appears. You're here for a moment and then you're gone. It says, we all must die. We are like water spilled on the ground. You ever spill water on the dirt? You see it for a second and then it's just gone. This life is fragile. So fragile. But the good news is what Jesus offers is life eternal. He comforts his disciples by saying, I am not just the way to the destination. I'm not just the truth to help you find the destination. I am the destination. He said, I am the life, (laughs) the life. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
people, man, we don't know what to do with a statement like this. <laughs> you might be in the room right now thinking, well, it's not very open-minded of you, Jesus. Well, you're not being very accommodating to all the other people who have a different belief system, Jesus. <laughs> no, he's not. And he's not trying to be. Jesus doesn't come on the scene and say, hey, how do I buddy up with everyone in a different belief system and we can all just get along and never have conflict at all? No, Jesus came to show us how to get home. That's why he came. He came to make a way where there was no way. He came to be the truth that we can believe in so that we may have life everlasting. And he says, I've come to show you the way because without me, you're lost. You're lost. He says, no one comes to the Father but by me. So the question is, how do we get home? How do we get home? Like I said, there's this gap, right, between where we are and where we wanna be. How do we get home? How do we get to our eternal destination? Well, the answer this morning is through Jesus and only Jesus. It will never stop being Jesus. Never. Can we stand on up to our feet? Man, this life, it's like Pearson International Airport. <laughs> It's we're living, there's still purpose, there's still a mission, there's, there's fun that we can have, but listen, it's not it. And we know this, right? We feel this. We feel this in our bodies. We see this in the world, like this is not our home. And sometimes we get so focused on the here and now that in the same way that the disciples were distracted and, and confused and hurting, we need the voice of God to speak over us. And so what I want to do, I, I want to read John 14, 1 to 3 again. Except this time when I read it, I don't want us to think about the disciples in the upper room with Jesus. When we read these words, I want you to hear this like Jesus is speaking over your life right now. Whatever you're facing, whatever trouble is before you, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, hear the words of Jesus. He speaks in this moment and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back to take you to be with me that you may also be where I am. Parker, you need to see this right now like a groom coming back for his bride. One day, Jesus will come back for his church. And when he does, he's bringing heaven with him. Like there is a day coming in the future where heaven and earth are going to collide and become one shared space. And on that day, we will be in new resurrected bodies on a new resurrected earth with God. And on that day, on that day, we will be home. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. And so in the meantime, we hold on to the words of Jesus. Do not let your words, or do not, do not let your heart be troubled. He says, listen to my words. I am the truth. Listen, I am the way. He says, and I am the life. We need to get our eyes onto Jesus. He is the only way. He is absolute truth. He is the source of life. Listen to me. He is the great I am. He is the great I am. In the Gospel of John, we see Jesus repeatedly taking the title of the I am and speaking it over our weaknesses. The, like, the great I am dominates the Gospel of John. To those who are walking in darkness, he says, I am the light. 
To those who feel lost, he says, I am the way. To those who are confused, he says, I am the truth. To those under the curse of death, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. To those who feel insufficient, he says, I'm the good shepherd. To those who need a fresh start, he says, I am the vine. To those who need a savior, he says, I am the life. Parkwood, Jesus is the great I am. He is the only great I am. There is no other great I am. It is him and him alone. And so today, as we close, what I wanna, what I wanna just call us to do before we leave is just worship. Come to God. Come to God. There is a gap between where we are and where God has designed us to be, wired us to be. We feel this inside of us. This earth is not our home. But right now, the most important decision we can ever make is just to give our lives over to Jesus. Like I said, he's the one who stands in the gap who died the death you should have died. It was your sins, it was my sins that kept him there. But he did it out of love. He came into the world to be the bridge so that we can get home. So that one day, we don't have to hang out in Pearson International Airport anymore. <laughs> we get to go home. And so listen, if you've never made that decision before in your life, maybe like you just, I just need to tell you, like listen, there's no better decision you could ever make. And all it takes is you just saying, Jesus, I need you. I need you. I, I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need everything that you are right now. I need you to be the bridge for my life. And if that's you, all you need to do is call out to him and just say, Jesus, be my bridge. Forgive me of my sins. Today, I accept your finished work on the cross. You are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And I'm putting my hope in you. So if that's you, all you need to do is call out to God. You can even do that just as we sing out this song. Church, if God just calling you back this morning. Maybe you just feel energized. You just want to worship. I just want to call us in this moment. Let's sing. Let's worship. Let's call out to our God. He is the great I am. The great I am, like I said, dominates the gospel of John and speaks clearly over our weaknesses and our struggles. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is who he said he was.